The Lacanian Subject by Bruce Fink. This is the afterword. Marx says of the capitalist system that one can begin one's examination of, of it at any point without missing any of its features. The order in which one's study proceeds is thus of no importance. One can pick up the thread of the fabric of capitalism anywhere. The same is no doubt true of Lacanian psychoanalysis, and the logic of my presentation of it here is certainly contingent, based only on the order in which certain of Lacan's notions sorted themselves out in my own mind. This book was never conceived as a whole, representing instead a compilation of papers or talks on specific themes prepared for widely varying audiences, worked together after the fact to establish a semblance of unity. That unity remains somewhat ad hoc, but it had to be provided to satisfy the requirements of the other, in this case, the American publishing industry. The book's best moments are, it seems to me, tucked away in certain subsections and notes, where I associate at some length without regard to the appropriateness of such ruminations at the particular points in the whole at which they appear. The ununified nature of the whole may, however, be troublesome to some readers in certain respects. In my early work on Lacan, I was quite concerned about grasping the true distinctions between the name of the father, um, and then S-A in brackets, and then a bunch of symbols, and so on, being troubled by their multiple meanings and uses, the constant introduction of homonyms <clears throat> and ubiquitous grammatical ambiguities. Here, on the other hand, I have played fast and loose with many of these terms, interpreting them as deemed as seemed fit for each different context. This allows for a certain fluidity in the use of concepts, but I shall, on the other hand, perhaps be taxed for a lack of rigor. If mathematicians use symbols that mean nothing, psychoanalysts use symbols that can mean so many different things, and positivists unsuccessfully attempt to assign one single unambiguous meaning to each term. What is to be done? A closer look at the work of mathematicians nevertheless suggests that like the proverbial three rabbis with four different opinions, there are virtually as many different theories of the foundations of mathematics as there are of the Big Bang, the origin of life on earth, and so on. Perhaps the symbols used by mathematicians, meaning nothing, are open to any and all interpretations. That is certainly not the case with Lacan's symbols. Their meanings may be multiple, but there is a definite logic to their transformations or shifts in meaning. Object A begins as imaginary and moves into the real in the late 1950s and early 1960s. S, A in brackets, begins in the symbolic and moves towards the real. The shift is always towards the real. Each symbol thus has its own historical, conceptual contexts and undergoes discernible transformations. No one can ultimately be satisfied with this book, as everyone will think that I have not adequately dealt with the theoretical issues most important to them in their, pers in their respective fields. The literary critic will feel that I have scanted Lacan's style and rhetoric and his notion of metaphor. The philosopher that I have blithely glossed over tremendous debates in logic and set theory presenting old formulations as if they were the latest advances. The psychoanalyst, that the attention I pay to speculative logical systems is greater than that granted clinical issues, and that subjects such as death and jouissance receive short shrift. The feminist, that I have not sufficiently developed Lacan's views of sexual difference, and thus have not exposed the shortcomings therein. The student, that I have provided needless commentary on the oftentimes abstract origins, of Lacan's notions instead of presenting a clearer, more straightforward version of them, the academic that I have devoted hopelessly little space to situating my views with respect to those put forward by others writing on Lacan today. To these critiques, all of which are no doubt justified in part, I can only reply that Lacan is of interest to scholars and practitioners in far more fields than I could ever hope to familiarize myself with. As an analyst, I only come to understand what Lacan is getting at through experience, being ineluctably led to certain notions by my an analysis.
Quite often it is my clinical practice that allows me to come up with a glimmer of an interpretation of a particularly striking but obscure passage in Lacan's work. I hope to rectify in future writings some of the obvious inadequacies and imbalances of this one. Nevertheless, I suspect that certain readers will still feel that I am skirting the issues most important to them. But it is for those most knowledgeable in a field to draw out the implications for that field of Lacan's, or anyone else's, work. The very idea of a book was quite foreign to Lacan's mind. The writings he brought out were often published grudgingly at the entreaty of others. Was he simply being coquettish? In part, perhaps, but more profoundly, he seems to have wished the system seems to have wished his system to remain an open system, always an anti-system. Publication means fixity, the formation of doctrine, and ultimately an approach to psychoanalysis that begins with nothing but preconceived ideas, set notions about what one should find in an analysis, and what should occur in the process. In a word, standardization, just as Freud in his papers on technique cautioned practitioners not to fill their minds with ideas about and goals for their analyses, but rather to be open to everything they say and do by paying free-flowing or evenly hovering attention to the analysand. Lacan reminds his students over and over to stop trying to understand everything because understanding is ultimately a form of defense of bringing everything back to what is already known. The more you try to understand, the less you hear. The less you can hear something new and different. It is absolutely clear from their work that Freud and Lacan experimented with both psychoanalytic practice and theory all their lives. Lacan is indeed one of the few analysts who followed the spirit of Freud's work, even as he paid incredible attention to the letter of it as well. That spirit requires a certain openness, not incompatible with trenchant critique of the work of others who, ter- who return to pre-analytic notions, an openness we might associate with Lacan's own teaching style, attacking orthodoxy, exploding his own emerging orthodoxy, challenging the master signifiers of his own field, some of which were of his own making. Lacan's discourse as a teacher seems to come under the discourse of the hysteric, a discourse that never accepts authority for authority's sake. Lacan takes Freud very seriously, but nevertheless contradicts him at times after careful consideration. The point is not merely to avoid criticizing without prior reflection on the basis of preconceived notions, but also not to be obsessed with formulating a system that explains everything as is required by the university discourse. The best teaching discourse is the hysterics discourse, which Lacan associates with the best scientific activity. It is not always an easy discourse to sustain for those who do not adopt it spontaneously, nor for those in the, in the publish or perish world of American academia. Reading in, no way, reading in no way obliges you to understand. You have to read first. That was a quote from Lacan. My reading of Lacan's work here apparently calls for some explanation in the context of contemporary American intellectual trends. While this book was still in manuscript, virtually everyone selected by publishers to read it remarked that I was not critical enough of Lacan, implying that it was not sufficient to provide a close reading of his work or a detailed explanation thereof without immediately launching into critique. In the end, I began to view the situation as quite comical, maddening as it was. It was becoming quite evident that in the world of American academic publishing, the time had passed when one could seriously study a thinker, at least a contemporary thinker, without simultaneously correcting his or her views. Nevertheless, that particular privilege is above all refused to scholars writing on Lacan, not so much to those writing on Derrida, Kristeva, Foucault, and other contemporary figures. Why is that? Reading Lacan is an infuriating experience. He almost never comes right out and says what he means, and the explanations that have been proffered for this run the gamut. The man couldn't write, much less think straight. 
He never wanted to be pinned down or held to a specific theoretical position. He did it all on purpose, deliberately making it difficult, if not downright impossible, to figure out what he was getting at. His writing operates on so many levels at once and requires knowledge of so many areas in philosophy, literature, religion, mathematics, etc., that you can only grasp what he is saying after having read all of the background material, and so on. All those statements are both true and false. Having translated five of his Ikri now, I find him an unbearable writer to translate, but a pleasure to read in French, which does not mean that he no longer drives me to distraction at times with his ambiguities and vague formulations, but his work is so evocative and provocative that there are a few texts I enjoy more. It may well be true that he was unable to express his thought very clearly at times, but is that not true of everyone, and is it not bellied by the brilliant clarity of certain of his formulations? His multitudinous allusions and references may trouble certain readers, but the key to understanding him is not to read all of the background material first. That only leads to more confusion. No, the problem is that a peculiar temporal logic is involved in reading Lacan. You cannot read his writings, in particular the Ikri, unless you already know more or less what he means. This is less true of his seminars. In other words, in order to get anything out of his writing, you already have to understand a good deal of what he is talking about. And even then. Therefore, you either have to learn about Lacan from someone else, with all the biases that entails, and then try to verify or refute what you have learned by examining his texts. Or you have to read and reread and reread his work until you can begin to formulate hypotheses of your own, and then reread yet again with those hypotheses in mind, and so on. Not only is that a problem in terms of the publish or perish economic reality of most academics, leading to serious temporal tension around understanding and production, but it also runs counter to a certain American pragmatism and independence. If I cannot put someone's work to use for me in a relatively short space of time, what is the point? Above, above all, I need to prove that I am an independent thinker, and thus I must criticize it as soon as I think I have begun to understand it. Therefore, I must read it with a view to critiquing it, short-circuiting the time for comprehending, and proceeding directly to the moment of concluding. In the 1960s, Lacan ridicules those who talked about understanding Freud before translating his work, which is merely common sense after all, as if one could understand anything about Freud before engaging in the complicated task of translation. The same is obviously true of Lacan. Translation has to come first, in some sense, in understanding him, but you cannot even begin to translate without certain keys and reference points. You think you begin to understand as you translate, and as your understanding grows, your, translation ev your translations evolve, though inevitably not always in the right direction. You must jump to conclusions about his work and formulate hypotheses if anything is to take on meaning for you in his texts, and yet at the same time, what you understand is a bit precipitated. All understanding involves jumping the gun, jumping to conclusions, but that does not make all conclusions correct. The reaction in the United States to an author like Lacan is, one, if I can't figure him out myself, then he's not worth thinking about. Two, if he can't express himself clearly, then it must be muddled thinking. Three, it nev I never thought much of French theory anyway. Which is reminiscent of a th of the threefold denial concocted by the man accused by his neighbor of having returned a kettle in damaged condition. One, I returned it undamaged. Two, the kettle had a hole in it when I borrowed it. Three, I never borrowed the kettle in the first place. If an author is worth reading seriously, you have to take for granted at the outset that as, as crazy as certain ideas may at first seem, considered in greater detail, they may become more convincing or at least lead you to understand the aporias that gave rise to them. That is more credit than most people are willing to give an author, and a love-hate ambivalence gets played out around reading. To assume that it is not as crazy as it sounds is to love the author. I love the person I assume to have knowledge. Whereas to read it critically comes off as hate. Are you with him or against him? Perhaps hate is the condition for a serious reading, but, 
Perhaps I would read Aristotle better if I assumed he had less knowledge. If that indeed is the condition, it had better be preceded by a prolonged period in which the reader loves the author and presumes him or her to have knowledge. That love is hard to sustain in the United States. The work by Lacan that is thus far appeared in English has for the most part been poorly translated. There is no psychoanalytic text in which clinicians can observe Lacanian practitioners at work and see the immediate benefits at the clinical level of Lacan's distinctions and formulations. And learning from someone else about Lacan in the United States generally means learning from someone who started reading these hermetic texts only a couple of years before you did. The French man or woman in the street understands nothing of Lacan and cannot explain a single one of his formulations. Lacan may be typically French and closer in spirit to the French mind than to the American, but virtually no one in France comes to understand Lacan by reading the écrit. As Lacan says, they were not meant to be read. The French learn about Lacan in academic or clinical contexts, where they are taught by one or more of the thousands of Lacanians who worked with him and his associates, attended lectures, went to case presentations at the hospitals, spent years on the couch, and so on. They learned about Lacan's work firsthand as a praxis. In the United States, Lacanian psychoanalysis is little more than a set of texts, a dead discourse unearthed like ancient texts in archaeological finds, the context of which has been washed or eroded away. No quantity of publications can change that. For Lacan's discourse to come alive here, his clinical approach will have to be introduced alongside his texts, through analysis, supervision, and clinical work, that is, through subjective experience.